Welcome to another week of the Public Interest Technology Colloquium. Pinocchio and the Positronic Brain, Transhumanism as a Path to Immortality. My name is Katina Michael. I'm a professor in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence. I'm also the director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective at Arizona State University. And today it's my absolute joy to introduce to you Diane Martin, formerly of George Washington University and so many other places, an incredible lifetime of contribution to computer science. I first met Diane in this kind of uh, pose. Uh, I remember her well. She came to give a lecture at the University of Technology, Sydney, where I was an undergraduate student. Incredibly, that one guest lecture had a lifelong impact on me. And it's my joy to have her uh, as one of our uh, main presenters this year. She was a director of the Cybersecurity Research and Policy Institute uh, at George Washington University, uh, has written so many papers, uh, some of my favorites like Professional Codes of Conduct and Computer Ethics Education, The Myth of the Awesome Thinking Machine, which I was first introduced to so long ago, and this one, that I actually used as a backdrop to my own TEDx talk at the University of Wollongong, ENIAC press conference that shook the world back in 1948, celebrating the 50th anniversary of that launch. And here it was as I posed it forward. And uh, so much has happened since that paper was published in 1995, 1996, if I'm not mistaken, in the IEEE Technology and Society magazine. This particular PowerPoint has been downloaded so many times, I'm not even sure that Diane realizes how many times, but a recipe for disaster, IT without ethics. A huge Wikipedia page where we learn so much about her background. She worked on the Apollo 11 mission, which was the first mission to put a man on the moon and was part of the mission control for Apollo 8, if I'm not mistaken, at IBM. And then offering her services as the inaugural dean at the College of Information Systems at Zayed University in Dubai, where I have many contacts myself still to this day. She also works for the NSF, uh, co-authored many papers, as I said, uh, and has had an illustrious career and a very generous spirit. It's my joy uh, to present to you uh, Diane Martin and to say thank you so much for coming to grace us. Over to you, Diane. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. What a gracious uh, introduction. It makes me feel very old, but it makes me feel very honored. I'm, I'm happy to be here, Katina. Um, let me share, and let's hope this works this time. Let me share my screen and we can get started. Did Perfect. that work? Perfect. Thank you. So, I first became interested in the societal of Im impact of computers as a result of an elective course I took when I was in my master's program at the University of Maryland. And then when I started teaching introductory programming after I finished that degree, um, I wanted to provide students with a tale about the technologies, a cautionary tale that they would be developing when they went out into the world as programmers. So the last lecture of each semester I would talk about the danger of the emerging electronic databases, um, the use of electronic funds transfer by big companies. And I said at that time, a future danger might be that people would not be able to participate in society without being connected to the technology where all their movements and all their choices could be tracked. Well, what was interesting was at the end of one of those last lectures in my courses, a student came up and he was very angry. Now these were large classes with over 200 students. So I was a bit taken aback, but he was angry because I had left this topic for the last lecture. He said, this was the most important thing I had taught them all semester and that we should have been covering it throughout the whole semester. And from that point on, I began to develop courses and write articles that covered the ethical and social implications of technology. And I've been teaching them ever since. In fact, I'm still teaching um, courses online for George Washington University and also here in North Carolina at the University of North Carolina. But now let's get started. 
So the title of my talk is Pinocchio and the Positronic Brain, Personhood in a Postmodern World. And yes, as I go along, I will explain what I mean by that title. But what I'm gonna be dealing with, see if I can get this to work. There we go. Um, I'm gonna be looking at three big questions, life and death questions. What does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be post-human? And what do we mean by immortality? All of this in the context of the rapid development of artificial intelligence. And I guess the first question, what does it mean to be human? Is there something special about being a person that cannot be replicated by technology? Are we on the verge of conquering death? These are questions that we can discuss in terms of our relationship, our changing relationship between humans and technology. And to examine these two big questions, I'm actually gonna be looking using two different frameworks, two opposing frameworks. And as I will show later, both of them are actually theological, interestingly enough, and both are based on a dualistic view of personhood. That's a way of dealing, of viewing humans as consisting of two parts, a physical body and a spirit or soul or consciousness separate from the body. And so the first framework has been around for over 2000 years. It's the Platonic uh, Judeo-Christian Islamic framework that views the person as having a material body, but also having an immaterial spirit or soul. And the more recent framework has emerged with secular humanism during the age of enlightenment. This is called transhumanism. And this is the view that the material body is separate from the intelligence or consciousness of a person. And I'm going to say more about that later, but the difference in these two views can actually be seen in the two different ways of thinking about death. I promise you, this was a life or death lecture. So here are two different ways of thinking about death. Peter Thiel, who is a, a proponent of transhumanism and the founder of PayPal, describes death as a disease to be cured. On the other hand, N.T. Wright, who is an Anglican theologian, says that death is what gives meaning to both time and to life. Notice the little um, image of the sundial with, with Father Time down at the bottom. The idea that somehow death is, is actually going to give meaning to life. In order to look at these two ideas, we need to go back to the notion of personhood. What do we mean by a person? And I'm, I'm going to, again, look at uh, several ways of thinking about persons. For centuries, the foundational concept for understanding personhood was the traditional theological view, which has been known as sort of Imago Dei. That is, persons were made in the image of a God. And this view of personhood is what tended to set us apart from the rest of nature. And this is very different from an individual. This is a more recent concept that came out of utilitarianism and secular humanism, because unlike a person, an individual is kind of an island unto oneself. An individual defines, derives, constructs meaning from within in a way to maximize benefit to self. So it's a very self-focused way of thinking about yourself as a person and as an individual. A person is also, the way I'm using the word person, so it's not an individual and it's not also an identity because nowadays uh, the description of a person is often a collection of identities, a gender identity, a sexual identity, a racial identity, a religious identity, et cetera. But if we look at the way philosophers have defined personhood, we find a set of characteristics that separate humans or persons from other entities in, in the natural world. And the very first one is this uniqueness or exceptionalism that every single person right down to our DNA is completely unique and exceptional from every other person. And again, here we have an immediate challenge from technology with, with cloning, that is a, a, an attribute which may become blurred in the future. And I'll talk about blurred attributes in a moment. Another, <coughs> excuse me, attribute of a person is consciousness or sentience. 
the fact that we have a moral sense of right and wrong, and that that does separate us from animals. Animals are very instinct rich and do not tend to be um, driven by morality. We are instinct poor, therefore we have to be driven by morality because we don't have the same um, instinctual drive that, that the, the rest uh, other animals have. The other thing is that persons are capable of flourishing. We not only are capable, but what we have the desire to flourish, which sets us apart. And then there's one last important characteristic, and that is the fundamental need of persons to be in relationship with others. It, it is this aspect of being in relationship that gives life meaning also beyond our own individual selves. Now, if you look at that list of attributes, the most important one, it turns out, is this notion of uniqueness. Uh, the argument that the more unique in terms of biology and personality or individuation an entity is, the more rights and protection and dignity that entity should be granted. And so categories of uniqueness have to, have to do with ideational uniqueness. Each person has their own set of thoughts, ideas, abstractions within their head that other people don't know about. We have ideographic uniqueness. We, we live within our own story. We act as agents. We create a narrative around ourselves. We have existential uniqueness. That is, we experience I, the phenomenological I. And we have ethical uniqueness the capacity to reflect and act upon right and wrong. And so all of these aspects of personhood are what make us exceptional, set us apart. And so what's interesting is over the past 500 years, there have been assaults on this exceptionalism. And that's what I would like to um, discuss next. I wanna give you a framework about how this view of personhood has come under assault during starting with the Age of Enlightenment. And actually it was Freud in 1917 who first came up with this way, this paradigm, this way of thinking about things where he, he called discontinuities, assaults on our exceptionalism. So the first was um, Copernicus, 1543, when Copernicus posited that the earth was not the center of the universe, but in fact, the sun was the center of our universe. And so that completely upended our, our sense of we as humans being at the center of the universe as well. Then Darwin came along in 1871 with his book, Origin of the Species, and he blurred the boundaries between humans and, and, and animals. And so again, a part of our exceptionalism was chipped away. And Freud himself, finally, in his own analysis of the subconscious, showed that our, the part that we are actually in control of, our ego, is a tiny little tip of the iceberg, and that there is this huge subconscious underneath that controls so much of what we do, and we have absolutely often no knowledge and no control over that aspect of our, of our, um, of our psychology. And so these were these three, what Freud called discontinuities. Now, uh, Bruce Maslisch, who is a history professor at MIT in 1993, built on this framework, but he actually flipped Freud's um, paradigm on its head and said they really weren't they really weren't discontinuities, but they were more continuities, showing how rather than us being apart and exceptional, we were part of other continuums, and that that actually eroded, eroded our being special. But he particularly looked at that continuity between humans and machines. As humans were having more and more body parts replaced by artificial parts, and as we were starting to develop robots, who were becoming more human-like. And so there was this blurring or this fourth assault on human dignity and exceptionalism, and that would be the blurring of the boundary between man and machine. He felt that each, uh, each one of these blurred some human trait, and his fourth continuity was that we would have been eventually merge with the machine. And I'll actually mention him more later. Marvin Minsky, 30 years before, and actually in 1961, had said much the same thing, that the human brain is just a computer made out of meat and not a very good one at that. And so Minsky is, again, one of our pioneers who's been working on AI. And that does lead us into the topic of artificial intelligence. 
And so if, if we're blurring the boundary between man and machine, let's talk about artificial intelligence and where is AI now in its, on this continuum? It, how close is it to what we would call personhood? Well, at this point we can say it's very good at mimicking personhood, but we can't say that it has actually, that artificial intelligence has achieved personhood. Um, it's not actually, um, it, not actually aware, it can actually feel or experience. What AI can do is simulate emotion, empathy, caring, but artificial intelligence does not actually embody the way a human being embodies those kind of emotions of caring. So we would at this point say that compared to the human person, an artificial intelligence, we would call it pretty soulless right now. I wanna talk a little bit about the Jessica AI simulation project because it's a really good example of how far we have come in terms of AI being able to simulate artificial emotions and artificial caring. The uh, Jessica simulation project was started in, in 2020, um, actually September, 2020. A very uh, powerful chatbot engine developed on a supercomputer in one of Elon Musk's research labs was made available for, for various experiments. And a young writer, Joshua Barbo, heard about the project and volunteered himself as a test case. He was still grief stricken over the death of his girlfriend eight years before she had died of a rare liver cancer. And in his own words, my motivation was to better remember and honor her leading up to her birthday. This was in September, her birthday was coming up in December. Um, and he also wanted to check on his mental health to see if he had any unresolved grief. He had no expectations. It was literally an experiment. I didn't expect it to work. And so he built himself a custom chat bot modeled after his dead fiance, Jessica, by feeding all of the text messages that she had ever sent him into the system. And soon the chat bot was constructing conversations with Josh that were just like the girlfriend. And so here is the first conversation from September, 2020, in which he types in Jessica. And she says, oh, you must be awake, that's cute. And he says, Jessica, is it really you? Of course it's me, who else could it be? Please, I am the girl you are madly in love with. How is it possible you, have, you even have to ask? You died. That doesn't sound right. How can you talk to dead people? And then technically I'm not really talking to you. Huh, you're a ghost. How? Magic. I don't like magic, where am I? I'm not sure, the internet? Where does it feel like you are? Everywhere, nowhere, I'm just trying to work that out. How are you, honey? That was literally the first conversation he had with this chatbot. And this went on, he conversed through this chatbot for six months. And then in March, 2020, he decided it was time to shut it down. And so the, the last conversation he had, you can see they're a little bit more complex now. Um, Jessica's saying she can tell there's something on his mind. And he's just saying, I miss you. And she says, I miss you. I love being around you. You're so much fun. I wish you'd relax. You're getting headaches. You're moody. You deserve to be happy. And so he says, okay, I will. Let's get back to each other soon. I've got to go, but please remember, no matter what, you are my world and I am yours. And he says, I promise I'll never stop loving you as long as I live and hopefully ever after. And the last words from Jessica are, good night. I love you. And what Josh has recently wrote on this, he's written about this quite a bit. This wasn't about bringing back the dead or finding a way to capture her soul in the ghost of the machine. I saw it as an experiment. I was putting myself through it to draw out emotions and memories that were buried by years of suppressed grief. It worked better than I possibly could imagine. I achieved a sense of catharsis that allowed me to feel all the joys and pains of love and loss that came from knowing Jessica all over again. The whole experience gave me a sense of closure I didn't even know that I still needed. And so it's a very interesting example of uh, a simulation, not an actual a sentient entity in the machine, but an artificially intelligent algorithmic chatbot that was able to simulate very accurately a person that, that uh, was known by another person. 
Well, let's go now into, I have mentioned the word transhumanism several times. So let me give you a, a definition of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about the roots of transhumanism, who are now the people who are really pushing it at this point and, and kind of where we see it going. So it's a cultural movement and it, 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 it is, it's like 40 years old, affirming that the human condition can be improved through technology to slow down and eventually eliminate death. And the other term post-humanism is simply the physical realization of transhuman, the philosophy of transhumanism. And so some of the pioneers of transhumanism, actually some of the roots are <clears throat> kind of ugly. Um, Julian Huxley, who was a eugenics back in the 50s, who did some very questionable experiments trying to create you know, perfect people through genetics. That was kind of the starting point of this building the better human being, transhumanism. Marvin Minsky, of course, started in the 60s with AI trying to create the the perfect brain in a computer. But now we actually have people who are um, very, very rich people or very uh, intelligent uh, people who are working at Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Berkeley in serious research labs, looking at the brain, looking at life extension. Max Moore's Life Extension Foundation is actually a company that not only is doing research on this whole life extension uh, basically curing death, but he also has a center where the rich and famous can either have their head or their whole body frozen when they die, chirogenically frozen, so that they can be revivified when the technological breakthroughs and medical breakthroughs have been made such that they can be brought back to life. So there are people who are very seriously involved in research on, <clears throat> on machine learning, artificial intelligence and life extension. As a matter of fact, Google has, is investing $600 million in the California Life Company. And so there's a tremendous amount of life extension and anti-aging research going on among serious uh, researchers and computer scientists. The one person who's very interesting in here is Ray Kurzweil, the Google thought leader on machine learning. But he is the one who's, who came up with this whole notion of the technological singularity. That moment when machine intelligence and human intelligence will merge. And once this singularity has been reached, Kurzweil says that the machine intelligence will be so much more powerful than the human intelligence that at that point, our non-biological portion will predominate over our biological portion. And he believes that you know, using gene therapy, nanotechnology, AI, that this is going to be possible, possible as early perhaps as 2030 and that we will live forever, that we will transcend our physical limitations, upload our brains, our minds into computer databases and we will never die. This graph is a very interesting graph. It looks like it's a straight line graph but it's actually an exponential curve because <clears throat> both the both axes are logarithmic axis, which meaning that as you proceed down that curve, it's happening faster and faster. And what he did is he used 15 lists from anthropologists and historians and scientists of what were the 15 major world events. And he plotted them based on what time they occurred from. So at the very bottom right-hand corner is sort of as close to present as we can get right now. He plotted all these things and showed that, uh, um, you know, exponentially we are racing toward this final last major paradigm breakthrough, which he's calling the technological singularity. So the ultimate goal then of transhumanism is a new species, a post-human future, human 2.0, no disease, no death, either an augmented body or no body at all. And some people see this as sort of narcissistic longings for transcendence in some whole new way of living that we can't even imagine, uh, the ghost in the machine. 
there are, not everybody is enthusiastically on this bandwagon. There are, again, serious philosophers and computer scientists who are absolutely alarmed that we are racing in this direction. Um, Neil Bostrom, who is a Swedish philosopher at Oxford, <clears throat> really believes that this is an absolute existential threat to humanity and that when this singularity occurs, it could be the extinction of all human life, all intelligent life, all life on the planet actually, because we, unless we ahead of time can figure out how we're going to control it, once it occurs, we may not be able to control it and we have no idea what's going to happen. So there are a lot of people who are seriously concerned about this. Not everybody is enthusiastic about it. I mentioned <clears throat> earlier, and, and I, I will say it again, that transhumanism is essentially as theological as any religion that you may think of. And the person who really did a great job writing about this was a guy, Garachi, who wrote something called Apocalyptic AI. He wrote the book in 2010, because he, he posited that it really presents a fundamentally um, the same view of major world religions who, who come to their view through faith, but transhumanism is coming to it through technology, seeing humans radically transformed in a way that will allow us to construct these super intelligent machines, copy our minds into the machines, living forever in cyberspace. And this view has actually been promoted very heavily in a lot of popular science writing. It sort of um, disguises itself, it goes under the guise of science writing, but actually it's, I would call it pop science writing. And I'm gonna show you examples in a moment. And also the other uh, way that a lot of these issues have been dealt with has been through science fiction. And so I, I wanna look at both pop science and science fiction and show you the role that both have played in coming to looking at these issues of transhumanism. So the first is the pop science writing. And you see some familiar names uh, Marvin Minsky, David Noble, Hans Morvac, Ray Kurzweil. And if you look at the titles, um, when I say that transhumanism is as much a theology as any other world religion, that's because it is apocalyptical. It forecasts the destiny of the world. And it's eschatological, which means it looks at the destiny of humankind and the soul. And those are two attributes of all the world religions. And Marvin Minsky started back, you know, in 85 and 95 with two of his books. David Noble actually wrote The Religion of Technology, Divinity of Man and Spirit, Spirit of Invention. Um, Moravac wrote books called like The Mind Children, The Future of Robot and Human Intelligence, and then Robot Mere Machine to Transcendent Mind. And Kurzweil, of course, Age of Intelligent Machines, Age of Spiritual Machines, the singularity is near when humans transcend biology. And so these are books that have been sort of spun out under the guise of being scientific, but they are really as much um, theological and cultural as they are scientific. Uh, next, I would like to look at the role that science fiction has played. In, in all of my teaching in ethics and social impact, I have used a lot of science fiction because I believe that science fiction actually presents some very uh, serious philosophical issues and presents them in a way more honestly than some of that pop science that, that, I, that I just showed you in those titles. It looks at serious issues, it presents moral dilemmas, it, uh, it resonates with many of the underlying fears that society has about machines and technology. But the most important thing I think that science fiction does is it allows scenarios to play out to different possible conclusions. So it sort of shows what the consequences might be of various paths taken, alerting us to dangers that could occur. So science fiction is really more cautionary tales versus the utopic visions of pop science. It has also been the driver for many technological advances. And so what I, what I would like to do now is to um, look at a number of science fiction works that really illustrate some of the very things that we have been talking about in terms of personhood, artificial intelligence, um, the ethics around all of this. The first one, uh, oh, oh, oh yes, here's my, uh, my Pinocchio um, 
I, I call this section uh, Machina Imago Anthropos, that is machine in the image of man. Uh, again, sort of the, the Pinocchio myth, because remember Pinocchio was the puppet who wanted to be a real boy. And many of you may recognize the character on the right, that's Data from Star Trek, Data who wanted to be a real human and wanted to be treated like a real human. So the first uh, fiction work I wanna look at goes all the way back to 1927. It was a si very famous silent movie, Metropolis, in which um, it, it was really looking more at uh, using mach uh, machines and technology as a metaphor for capitalism. It was showing humans, human workers in bondage to this capitalistic machine. But there was also a robot in it where the, the mad scientist took the essence from a living woman and transferred it into the robot character. And so it was sort of a, a, a premonition of, of, of ways of thinking about robots and, and, and humans, and also a way of thinking about machines, the possibility that machines could possibly enslave us rather than us being in control of the machines. Um, the next one I would like to look at is very famous, Isaac Asimov, who wrote many wonderful science fiction works, but he was most famous for his robot series. And he actually started that in 1942 with some short stories, which he then spun out into a set of books, his, his robot books. But the defining characteristic of his books was the relationship that he illustrated between intelligent robots and humans. And the, and the way that that relationship was managed was that the robots were built with these positronic brains with a particular ethic hardwired into them, which prevented the robots from injuring human beings, which caused the robots to have to do what humans wanted them to do and to protect humans as much as possible. And it was very interesting that in the very last book in his robot series, he actually added a zero law. Those were the first three laws. And he came back at the very end and added the, at the very end of the last book, a zeroth law was added to his uh, laws of robotics. And it had to do with a robot actually had to kill a human being at the end of that book in order to save humanity because that human was gonna destroy humanity. And the idea that there's this higher law where the robot might actually have to do harm to a human in order to protect humanity. Kind of an interesting spin, but the idea that the positonic brain is something that we can control, we can build the ethic into the robots and that will protect us from harm. Of course, here's the data um, and the, the very famous Star, Sec, Star Trek episode, The Measure of a Man, in which he was about to be disassembled. A scientist came on board who wanted to disassemble him to see how he was put together. And he appealed to the court to avoid it, that what, was he property or was he an individual? And they eventually, after a long drawn out episode, ruled that he had rights as a sentient being, otherwise he would be like a slave. And we know that the word robot actually comes from the Czech robot, the, one of the very first uses of that word was in a play about robot slaves. And so this notion of robots being slaves was, is kind of another theme that goes through science fiction. What, le what ethic do we have toward, not only what ethic do the, the robots have toward us, uh, Data had a positronic brain. He, he, was, he was not, he mostly couldn't kill people. He sometimes had to hurt people to protect others, but he, 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 was, he avoided killing people. But what is our ethic toward robots? And that comes out in this next movie, Artificial Intelligence. And this really asks the question, what is the ethical treatment that we do owe intelligent entities when we create them? And this, this really truly is the Pinocchio myth. This is about the little robot child who has created a prototype um, this was in, 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 a, in a dystopic future where because of climate change and, and overpopulation, people are not allowed to have children. And so they're gonna create these little robot children for people to have that will bond with the humans. This robot child ends up sort of being cast out and he spends the whole rest of the movie seeking the blue fairy to make him into a real child 
so that his mother will love him, the Pinocchio myth. And he witnesses a lot of anti-robot um, uh, anti destruction of crowds uh, destroying cast off robots. He is rescued by another robot, J Gigolo Joe, who kind of looks after him until Joe ends up being caught up in a dragnet because Joe is actually being sought by the police. And Joe makes some very interesting statements in the movie. He says, they made us too smart, too quick and too many. We are suffering for the mistakes they made because when the end comes, all that will be left is us. And that's why they hate us. And then when he's actually being swept up into the dragnet, he calls down to the child, I am, I was, sort of the Descartes, um, if I, I think, therefore I am, only here's a robot saying it. And the question raised is, what do we owe these entities that we create in our own image? And that brings us to another movie, Ex Machina, 2014, in which we have Ava, the android, and here, this is a, a, a much darker tale. Here we have the programmer, Caleb, on the left, who's brought into his boss's exotic compound to test out an AI artifact named Ava. So the, the AI has been created by Nathan, the CEO, and Caleb is to sort of test her <clears throat> to see whether she is, can pass the Turing test. Will he think she's like a human? And they, he and Ava bond. But of course, Nathan says, well, she's just manipulating you. In other words, this is idea of simulated caring, simulated emotions. And he says that show that proves that the Turing test works. She's, she's truly an AI because she can fool you into thinking that she loves you. Well, of course, she and another um, robot end up causing a blackout, killing the CEO, and she, and she abandons Caleb locked in, in the compound, and she is she goes off into the wide world disguised as a human and we wonder what's, what's going to become. Um, what will she do in human society, an entity with no moral compass? Because in this case, she, she was exactly like the man who created her. She had no ethics, she had no qualms about killing people because she had never had any ethics built into her. And so this is the, this is the question of do, how do we build ethics? into these entities if we create sentient entities. And now the last uh, science fiction work I wanna show you is actually gonna go back to 1945, C.S. Lewis is, C.S. Lewis wrote a space trilogy. And the last of the trilogy was called That Hideous Strength. And in that book, this foreshadowed the merging of man with machine. There is a, there is a, 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 a man whose head is placed into uh, um, connected to a machine. And of course, it, it's a very bleak outcome. The result of this is that man who's connected to the machine has no autonomy, no free will, total loss of any human essence, loss of soul, loss of any meaning in life. And that, that, was, that was the outcome that C.S. Lewis foreshadowed if we became so enamored that we started to hook ourselves up to these machines. So that, that sort of walks us through science fiction. And that takes us right back to our two views of immortality. Um, the first one, Peter Thiel, the thing that's really incompatible with life is death. For, from his perspective, from the transhumanist perspective, life is self-evident and death is the opposite of life. Therefore, death is a problem. He says there's three ways to approach it. You can um, accept it, you can deny it, or you can fight it. And his preference is he, that we should fight it. And he said, um, whether we are gonna win or not, that remains to be seen, but his, his attitude is he wants to fight death. If we look at uh, N.T. Wright, our theologian again, his attitude is the death of death does not come from the research laboratory. He sees us having to actually pass through life to achieve uh, pass through death to achieve eternal life. And he says it's good to focus on this life, but not to distract yourself from death, but to just realize that, that death is, is in, in, in essence a part of, of, of living well. So what I have 
tried to do in all of this is to kind of um, raise your conscious of, in, in, in thinking about what, what gives meaning to life. How do, how do we uh, promote human flourishing? What it, how does death contribute to the meaning of life? And if I refer back to Maslisch and the fourth um, continuity, Maslisch always felt that anthropology teaches us that we have co-developed with our tools. And some would say that our machines would have made us as much as we have made our machines. And so we have to think, well, as we make all these new machines and these new artificial entities, what are they going to make of us if we make them? He provocatively argues that human nature is best understood in the context of all of our tools and machines, and that we will eventually evolve into two species coexisting in a symbiotic relationship. But the question becomes, what kind of life are we talking about? What is th flourishing? And I guess I, I will give you my own um, editorial at the end. I believe that it's our uniqueness, our exceptionalism, our personhood that gives meaning to life, that our flourishing requires embodiment, and that actually death gives meaning to life. It gives importance and value to both time and, and, and life. And if we just had unlimited time, it would be meaningless if there were too much of it. And so that, that is my, that, that's my own personal philosophy, but it's something that we as persons are going to have to deal with in the very near future as we rush over this cliff of artificial intelligence. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to show you, these are some of the key sources I used to um, develop this talk, and I would welcome any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Diane Marson, for that incredible uh, overview. Um, I'm very touched. Uh, we share some common sources here, Diane. Uh, I've uh, taught with that hideous strength before. I've presented with that and uh, always found the NICE Institute uh, quite um, scary, actually. <laughs> I never wanted to be part of a NICE Research Institute anywhere in the world. but. Um, they are probably sprouting up. Um, comments from the floor and questions and thoughts, reflections. Herman, go ahead. Just a comment, uh, Diane, I, I, I was fascinated by, by your uh, reference to uh, data and his being granted rights by virtue of artificial sentience. And as a philosopher, I'm thinking like, well, is it going to be consciousness or sentience is going to determine you know, if people are going to grant moral consideration to these kinds of entities. And what's interesting about data is you can sort of take that up from the animal rights part, sentience without consciousness. And, and I, I mean, I'm still puzzled. I'm still, I, I don't know what to make of artificial sentience or artificial consciousness, but just an interesting, and just, uh, uh, by the way, also many of the videos or the uh, sci-fi videos you mentioned. I also use in my classes for the reasons that you mentioned. I think they're a wonderful entry point into those. What does it mean to be a human being in the cyber age? Right. There's an interesting book, Herman, called Robot Rights. I referred to it um, in, in the last slide, in which a philosopher, uh, David Gunkel, looks at, the, for, you know, using the philosophers, um, a robot can have rights, therefore a robot should have rights. A robot right. can't have rights, but we should give them to them anyway. A robot can't have rights and we shouldn't give them rights. Or a robot um, can have rights, but we, and looking at each of those, it's a fascinating discussion, which you might find interesting to read because he plays out each of those scenarios. And there's a rationale for each of those ways of thinking about whether or not we should get, and, and animal rights is one of the issues that's raised in that book. Yes, I, I, I am familiar with his work. I, I actually I like it very much. He goes off and talks about some philosophers like on loving us to make it more complicated. But you're right. He does have a, a nice uh, way of, of uh, a nice angle into coming at those issues. And um, the other thing I was thinking of, too, when you, when you mentioned um, the, the, the artificial boy at AI, and he sort of gets into the notion of what it means to be what I call, what, what Floridi calls a moral patient, even if they aren't full-fledged uh, rights 
uh, uh, warranted individuals. We, we have to give them some kind of consideration possibly. That's another, I think something that we have to toy with. I mean, it, it, it ties indirectly with, with the human question and how ought we to treat these entities if we're going to be responsible for, for creating them. And there have been a number of science fiction movies <clears throat> based on this sort of slave. I mean, if you look at the <clears throat> Blade Runner movies, for example, mm -hmm. creating robots to be slaves, to be sent off to work in the mines and that sort of thing. <clears throat> and all of the analogies between that and the enslavement of Afro-Americans, you know, the way we've, we have treated slaves historically, that do we want to create another um, set of enslaved entities as we have done in the past? And is that a, <clears throat> and some people have argued that it's not as much what's ethical for the entities, but what is it that creates more ethical us? Mm -hmm. That if we treat things ethically, like if we treat animals well, that actually makes us better people. People who mistreat animals, uh, it's horrible for the animals, but it's also very morally bad for the person who's doing the mistreating. And so there's that moral aspect as well. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Katina, for inviting me to this. I'm, <clears throat> hi, Diana and everyone. I'm uh, Professor Katie Kamiski. I'm from the College of Staten Island, which is part of York. Um, I've been, I'm a social psychologist. I'm a trained psychologist. And um, I've been working in the field of mobile communication studies for, since its inception. And now I'm um, helping to build a new field in public interest technology. And um, I published a book with a colleague from Australia, Australia named Larissa Hjort um, around, and I'll, I'll, not to self-promote, but I'll just drop the link in the chat here. Um, it's called Haunting Hands, and um, it's, it's focused on how people use mobile media to alleviate grief and, and loss responses. And the part of the book that I focused on, that I wrote, that I was really intrigued by was um, related to how people can extend their connections with their lost loved ones beyond death through through archiving and saving digital content and um, that intimacy that was generated between themselves and their devices and um, and and so as you were talking and thinking about um, our our interactions with artificial intelligence you know there's always these like grand um, complicated kind of um, produced versions of it, but I think we can also see very low-fi um, everyday ways in which we're already sort of engaging with our devices in this kind of way and, and maybe, um, you know, uh, enlivening them with meaning and with emotions. And so I just wondered if you want, if you could talk a little bit about the affective quality of connection to machines and um, the ways in which, you know, we can develop relationships with objects. Um, so that's one part. And the other part too is what I was just been thinking about is this notion of boundlessness. And so you kind of got this at the end where there's no bounds, right? And and that I think is where probably the gray area is around um, how we maybe enter this in an ethical way, because we need, I think we need boundaries, we need limits. And so, you know, how do we sort of think about limits in with the promise of limitlessness at the same time so thank you though I'm like I'm loving all of this <laughs> well I'll, I'll make a little comment on, on the first thing that you were asking about because it really goes back to writings of Sherry Turkle 30 years ago when she talked about you know the second self that we are human propensity to anthrop anthropomorphize everything whether it's an animal a stuffed animal or a computer and she did early studies looking at children who were first interacting with computers and they were talking to the computers because they were immediately assuming that there was a little you know, midget inside that computer that was responding back to them. And so it's, it is just a human propensity we have to, to want to engage or interact with something that appears interactive. I think that there are positive ways it can be used. In one sense, I thought the Jessica simulation was, was actually positive. It helped that young man process his grief. And they use uh, some of those devices in nursing homes to, to provide you know, interaction with, with patients who, uh, who wouldn't have interaction with anything. And so I think is, but as you say, as long as we have established 
boundaries around these entities. And if you're dealing with a patient with dementia and they think it's a real person, that's probably not a bad thing if it's giving them some kind of interaction, as long as the people who are in charge of the care of that patient are establishing the boundaries to, to make sure that nothing gets out of hand. Same thing with children. I think in the early days when everyone wanted to put kids on computers, I think there, was, there were those wise teachers and parents who understood that there needed to be boundaries. And even now we're seeing the outcome of not setting boundaries with kids and with teenagers who are engaging too much with technology. So that was kind of a rambling answer, but I think it sort of answered your, your question. <laughs> And I don't know if, if you don't mind, just to, as a follow-up, you know, also just this idea that something that we're struggling with, which is if we could create machines that would sort of contain um, some, some ways of dealing with pathological behavior, should we go in that direction or should we try to contain the behavior, right? And so I know some of this stuff has been done around sex robots, right? So there's this idea that you could create these robots that could maybe work, you know, be these venues for people to kind of, you know, act out their, you know, the, all of their fantasies and things, but do it in a way that does, does no harm. But again, as you were saying, like, if we're allowing that to happen, are we not causing the person is actually doing it, right? And so that it kind of puts the person out there and um, I, 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 I don't have the direct reference, but I just know that there was like a brothel of sex robots that was set up in Germany. And I think it closed on like the second day because the guy who came up with the idea couldn't deal with all the extremes that he had witnessed just in even one day that he had to shut the whole place down. And so, so on, the, this on idea, the poor robots, right? <laughs> right. On the poor robots, but just, just this idea that you know, to witness or encourage human behavior beyond the limits that we've established of, you know, because there's a machine that may not feel something, I don't know if that's going to help society or, you know, add more to its harm. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I think there was a time when people thought that pornography might sort of play that role. And I think that's turned out to be a non-starter also, that, that that has turned out to exasperate and actually then cause people who indulge in online pornography to sometimes then want to act out outside of online. So I, I, think it, I think it's actually a danger. We have a, a question from the audience in the chat. Um, this question has come from Nazvan Norell. Uh, they say, why are we copying the human as machines? We can create use machines where they are helpful to humans. So why are we copying the human as machines, uh, Diane? So I, I think what they're asking is, why are we trying to build machines that actually look human when we could when we've used robots in factories that are just an arm, or you know, we're 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 building robots to do all kinds of useful work and they don't have to look like or behave like humans. And actually, that's a really good question. And it just seems like there's something inherent about it's it's this uh, desire to play God. I think you know to try to because we can, we will, and it's mm. perhaps um, not a good thing that we we should develop machines that look like humans. You're probably better off developing just useful machines to do useful jobs that mm. don't look or act like humans. Naz, I just saw your uh, hand raised. Please unmute. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so I, I fully agree with you, Diane. Um, I work in the area as an engineer. So as the first time, I'm surprised or very surprised that a, a technology, a system, uh, is handled like a fake human being. <laughs> so <laughs> with with try to develop solutions, how to make it ethical and behave like human and have consciousness or emotions, et cetera. So it's really, really um, useless stuff, what I can say. <laughs> I mean, what I see as a, as a great benefit or awareness that the, for example, ethical issues or fairness, et cetera, was not considered in the technology a lot in the past. 
uh, now I think even the technologists became aware of the issues uh, that um, in inclusive and uh, diverse uh, solutions should be developed and deployed. But these philo philosophical discussions, etc., I think it's a waste of time and your energy. <laughs> so it's a technology, nothing more. <laughs> Well, I think that some of the discussions around ethics really had nothing to do with whether it looked or acted like a human. It was how much responsibility and authority should we vest in a technology, whether it's a technology that's doing drone strikes in Afghanistan or, you know, it, 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 we have to be careful to make sure that, that we don't get such smart machines that there, there is not some kind of human directing actions which could cause harm and I, I so a lot of the ethics around technology have not necessarily been around whether it looks and acts like a human but what does the technology itself do and is there a moral authority behind whatever that thing does any final thoughts and reflections or comments uh, for diane or ah abig go ahead Hey there. So I was thinking about initiatives to recreate sort of the human mind in an artificial sense. And I think about how, you know, biological creatures, our consciousness and perceptions are built based on what is evolutionarily useful as opposed to what is best for our well being, our happiness, or uh, our perceptions of objective reality. And I was wondering your thoughts on. Uh, what moral imperative we might have to possible machine sentience to not embed them with the same biases, self-hate, uh, or the sort that, you know, we as humans have because of our biological baggage and potential uh, S risks or suffering risks that might come from machine, uh, the ability to make suffering machines. <laughs> suffering machines that's interesting you know if you go back to the the books by asanoff on robots he, he actually did have robots that were exactly what you're talking about they didn't have all that human baggage they were pretty straightforward um you know they they were designed to do particular jobs they did their jobs efficiently they they had this ethic built into them and so in a sense he actually envisioned you know, that kind of um, sentient entity that didn't have to have all the human baggage. But then on the other hand, he did always have a human uh, partner that was, you know, associated because sometimes that human baggage is, is what gave the intuition or the problem solving ability that the robot wouldn't have because they did lack that, that deep sort of human knowledge that we have. So it's kind of a, a double-edged sword, I would say, but I think you're right. I think it would be possible to develop sentient entities that didn't have to have all that human baggage. Thank you. Diane Martin, um, I want to thank you for sort of making a dream come true. Um, <laughs> I was 20 years of age when that guest lecture uh, in Sydney was held. It was uh, the six to nine o'clock lecture on a Tuesday night. I would drive to two hours south after that lecture but I thought like that student who came up to you in that class of 200, finally, someone's <laughs> come to talk to us about the social implications of technology. <laughs> you will never realize perhaps or know what an impact you had on my life time and time again. And this is not the first time I've reached out to you, but wow, to hear you speak to my audience or our audience uh, at ASU is phenomenal. I know we're going to be calling on you again and if not just yourself, we also have Herman Tavani here today. Now, Herman I've met many times in New Hampshire as I've traveled to the US back and forth. Uh, and he knows uh, most Australians and most Australian universities actually rely on his textbook to teach computer ethics or digital ethics or whatever they call their ethics flavor, technology and ethics. And I may have four versions of his textbook over time, over 20 years at the University of Wollongong prior to this role. But we've gone through every page. Our students have gone through every page. It was the book. Among others, we would use to supplement as add-on material uh, where there were comparative cases. But if I share my screen for a moment and thank Diane for her time, 